slowly varying in, in the context of radar, everything's moving pretty fast, but, but this is relatively slowly varying. And we modulate it onto some carrier, some sinusoid. And then it goes out, send it out over the scene. And, and, uh, and, and I'm assuming the scene is a bunch of discrete scatterers of various ranges. And uh, what's reflected back is something like this. So it's the sum over the, uh, uh, the C's are the CK's and the reflectivities. It's the sum of, of, of over K of the over the scatterers, it's the reflectivity, times a, a delayed, a delayed uh, waveform because it's had to take time to go out there and come back. And, and because the scatterers might be moving, there's a Doppler effect. They're shifted in, in, in uh, frequency. I should say at this point that this is what's called the narrow band approximation. It's not strictly correct, uh, but it's, uh, it's what people, most people in radar use. And it's a very good approximation in most houses. So, another signal, uh, uh, which I'll call V, although very often, almost always, in what I'm going to be talking about anyway, actually not in the other, certainly what I'm going to be talking about, my V will be essentially the, the waveform I sent out. So you, you filter it against it, uh, removing the high frequency component, and you get something looking like that, and if you take a single scatterer, I mean this is just a linear combination of the scatterers, if you take a single scatterer, it looks like do a bit of renormalization and you get some for a single scatter you get something effectively that looks like that. And this is called the radar ambiguity function. 
invented by Woodward 60, 70 years ago. And it, it's, it's the basis of radar processing, really, because the shape of this ambiguity function determines how well the radar performs as a, as a, in terms of how well it, uh, uh, it estimates range and how well it estimates Doppler. Of course, ideally, you want a, a radar waveform, a waveform that does both pretty well. And I just mentioned that typically in modern radars, they do what's called quadrature processing, which I'm not going to say anything about, except to say that it allows to, us to think of the signals as complex. So in, in radar, you really do work in the complex domain. So signals of finite energy, L2, and then we get this very simple <coughs> equality for ambiguous functions. Uh, it's bilinear in, in W, V, and so on. So another way of thinking about the ambiguity uh, is to look at this operator, DTF, which on a, on a waveform V shifts it in frequency and in time in this way. You can easily see that these are unitary operator, and, you can, and then you can get the ambiguity by just doing this in W in a product with the image of V under this operator. And the D's are a sort of representation. That is, if we take D of T1 plus T2 F or this F2, if we add these two points in, in R2, then we almost get the product of the D's, except for a twist there. D is what's called the multiplier representation of R2, and in this case, the multiplier of this. I don't want to spend a lot of time on multipliers, but I mentioned them. So, so then, so then in terms of a, a thinking of it as a multiplier representation, we get this equation. So let's do a quick survey, a very quick survey of, of uh, representation theory. We assume G is a reasonably nice group. The unitary representation of G is a homomorphism from G to the unitary group on the Hilbert space, satisfying this. We assume the continuous. Uh, we say that two representations, let's call them one pi, and let's call one the other one theta, are equivalent if there's a, a linear map, uh, uh, sorry, it's equivalent if there's an isometry uh, V between H and K, two representation spaces, such that this diagram can be used for every element G of the group. And without an isometry constraint, this is called, he is called an intertwining operator, and if the only intertwining operators of, of, a, of a representation with itself are multiples of the identity, then Theory is said to be a reduced, and that's really the same as saying that there's no non-trivial subspace of the representation space of our uh, uh, theta, which is invariant under all, all, all of the PG. So that's really all I need for representations. So let's just talk about multipliers. As I said, multipliers are these sort of twist factors in representations. They, 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 they allow us to think so look at things slightly more general than the and by the way, I mean, if you, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but if you, if you, if you want to study representations, uh, you're forced to study uh, multiplier representations. They come out naturally in the theory, the Mackey theory, which allows you to construct representations of uh, big groups from little groups, for, uh, uh, is forced to consider multiplier representations, even though it starts out only looking at, 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 at J groups. So multiplier representations are really necessary. They're not, they're not some artifacts. Um, so rep multiplier representations, if we've got a gadget looking like that, which takes values in the circle and satisfies this weird looking constraint, then multiplier <coughs> representation satisfies this constraint. It's nice, and what do I mean by nice? Well, for multiplier representations, I only ask that this map be measured. Yeah, continue continuity will be too much. So if I start with a multiplier representation, then I can I can do a trick which um, which uh, is as follows: I take the group G of which it's a representation, and I extend it by a copy of the circle. I take the product of, of G with the circle, and I invent a new multiplication like that. And then I can make a multiplier representation into a genuine by this trick. So if I do this, 
then I really do get a genuine representation, not of G, but of this central extension. And now the, uh, the ambiguity looks like this, and in this case, this is our sigma representation where C is. So I've sort of said ambiguity in the context of multiplier representations, and indeed of genuine representations, provided we do the central extension. And what's the central extension in this case? Well, we, uh, we take our multiplier and think of it as taking values in T, but it, it's, often, it's usually the case that we allow our multiplier to take values in R, that look like this, and in which case, when we do the central extension, we get the height of it. And then the representation that comes from D, that we lift to the central extension, is exactly like this. So this is the central part. And then this lovely theorem of Stone and Neumann says D tilde is the only re irreducible representation up to equivalence that satisfies this property on the center. And, and that, that is a very powerful result. Because if we write down any other representation and we prove it's irreducible, <coughs> there's got to be this one. So there's got to be an operator intertwining with this, this representation. And this is a very powerful idea that physicists have used <coughs> for 100 years now almost. And, 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 and you know, it's a very significant part of basic theory of quantum mechanics. So I'm just restating everything up here. So ambiguity functions have fairly obvious properties. They're conjugate bilinear. They satisfy this. I've already said that. They, 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 they have this interesting property that if I interchange the two waveforms u and v, then I do this slight modification to, to, to the ambiguity. I multiply by uh, a phase, and I, I put minus signs in front of and the F. And if I take the Fourier transforms of U of B, this is more, much more interesting. If I take Fourier transforms of U of B, then I, I uh, have a phase factor two, but I, I, I flip the frequency and the time, and I and I'll return to this. Um, perhaps the most important property of ambiguity functions is what's called Moyle's identity. And it says the following. Oops. If I take if I take an ambiguity of u1 v1 and I inner product it, now these are functions on R2, remember, so I inner product it with u, uh, the ambiguity of u2 v2. So this is now I don't know why by that w should be uh, ignored. Um, and I take the inner product over L2 of R2, then what I get is the product of the inner product of u1 with u2 and v1 with v2 or again. And boiling that down to the case where all the u's are equal, all the u's and v's are equal, the norm of a of u in L2 of R2 squared is the norm of u to the fourth power. So let's just stop for a minute and think about what that means for a radar. So the radar basically smears the scene. If I think of the scene as, 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 as this two-dimensional range Doppler space, the radar smears the C according to this A. So ideally, what I would like is that my A doesn't smear. My A should be like a perfect spike. If it's a perfect spike, then when I convolve, which is exactly what I have to do, A with the C, I'll get the C back. Absolutely perfect. So ideally, I would like to choose a waveform for which this is a perfect spike. But the maximum value of A at the origin is the norm of V squared. And the norm of A, the L2 norm of A, is also the norm of V squared. Just think about this for a moment. We have this function on the plane whose value at the origin is V squared, is the norm of V squared, and whose, in, whose L2 norm is also V squared. It has to spread out. So Moyle's identity says that this, 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 this uh, ambiguity can't be a spike. It has to have well, what a radar engineer calls side loads somewhere. And so the art of radar engineering is to choose these for which the side loads 
are in places where you want them to be and are where they're not interfering with the problem you're trying to solve. And that's really hard. And, and, and uh, <coughs> Stephen Robin and I have been doing some work on some ideas there, which we think is quite novel, but I'm not going to talk about today. Um, but, um, but it's, it's, it's and, and you know, if you look in the literature, there have been thousands of papers written on, on designing waveforms in radar to give you nice properties of the images. <coughs> okay, so but I'm, today, so it's a math so I'll keep on. So, so let's so let's look at the Heisenberg group. Well, it's got to be algebra, of course, and we, we have the generators of the algebra. Of this, and we satisfy these common <coughs> properties. Uh, effectively, the canonic, canonical computation. And if we if we take our representation of the Heisenberg of the group, then in a in a very canonical way, uh, you can form a representation of the Lie algebra. And so now we have a representation of it. We started with a representation of the group. We have a representation of the, the algebra. It looks like this. So the, the, uh, the, the derivative of uh, the, the, the representation of T becomes this de derivative. And these are unbounded operators. Um, and the derivative of the frequency of this. And, and then the derivative of the central component is just the algebra. Uh, more interesting, oh, interesting anyway, uh, is mm -hmm. to create these operators, uh, A, which is uh, uh, given by this, and A star, which is adjoint given by this, and these are the annihilation and creation operators of quantum mechanics. And this, uh, this is the commutation property that we can. So, uh, so you can look at detailed array, look this and these over A star, <coughs> and it's the adjoint of these. So, so, uh, so, given that we we we're interested in this this representation, given that the representation gives us in this very natural way these operators A and A star, you would think there was some import in looking at waveforms whose derivative is. is for which the d tilde of a is of b is zero. And indeed there is, then the absolute is true. And if I if I if I apply d tilde, if I apply the, the creation operator to to uh, uh, b zero, I get uh, uh, b1, which is the first Hermine function. And if I apply the, the annihilation operator, I go back to the back to b zero. So I can create all the Hermit functions by applying creation operators to the D0. These are, these are exactly the same. So these VNs are very special for D, and they have very sharp ambiguity properties. So as I, I said before, um, um, if I, one, once, I've, once I've got this idea, of, uh, uh, once I've got the Stover Neumann theorem, then I know that any representation that's irreducible has got to be the same representation. So let me write down a new representation. And I'll write it down, not in terms of the group, uh, but in terms of these annihilation and creation. And all I need for the annihilation and creation operators in order that they give me a representation of, of, of the Lie group is, is, this, is this commutation relation. Provided that's true, I'll get it right. So, in this case, I'll take A. So I'll take my space, my, my Hilbert space, to be <coughs> a space of functions satisfying this, with this problem. So that's obviously a Hilbert space. Sees that. And, and the inner product looks like this. And then we'll make A correspond to this operator on this Hilbert space, and A star corresponds. They check, they satisfy the commutation relation, so you get a representation of, of the Heisenberg group, and this is the so-called Wagner sequence. Um, so let's look for the element of this space that corresponds to 
the Hermes, to the sort of fundamental Hermes in the, in the original, the Heisenberg uh, representation. And, and that's got to satisfy the same differential equation. Differential equation is defined in terms of Boolean algebra, so it must, be, it, must, it must correspond exactly to solving this. And it comes down to the J0 by the Z equals 0. J0 equals the constant. So Gn, so the Vn is the Hermes in, this, in the Bosman Siegel representation, just correspond to powers of Z. So to win all. So when we can write down the intertwine, so we know that the Bosman Siegel must be the same as the, the, as the original representation. Now at least it must be equivalent. What's the intertwining of it? Well, you don't do any work and you find out the constraints of the absolutely fundamental in this theory. And so I don't want to say yes. <laughs> so let's suppose I, I then um, so so the, so I can write now write down the, the bars and Siegel representation in, in all its gory detail and it looks like this. So I, I, this is my translation this is my application of the representation of T and F to G on the, in the bar of the single space and the formula for the representation. I, I now can calculate, it's a nice little calculation, I now want to calculate the ambiguity of a Hermit with another Hermit. So how do I do it? I move <coughs> to the single space and calculate it there. When I do that, I think it's pretty easy to, we know what JM is, it's just Z to the M and this is Z to the M. I could do the calculation over here, and what it, what it turns out to me is this, where this is the, the associated with the F. So, so by going from, uh, from uh, um, the original representation to the, the bartman Siegel space, I can do calculations that would be much harder to do over in the, in, in, in the original. Here's another representation that's of interest. I take um, the lattice subgroup Z2 of R2, and I can induce, I'm not going to talk about how you would do that. I can, I can induce the, the, the ordinary representation, the, the representation from Z2, which is essentially trivial in this context, up to R2. This tells you how to do it. And I get this representation. This representation is another representation of, of, uh, of the high <coughs> So reducible, you can check that. So it has to be equivalent to the original representation. What's the intertwining operator? It's the Weber is in Sachs formula. This formula here, where this function here is the, the Jacobi theta function of theta 3, and is the sum of this sum of this uh, exponential series here. And this leads on to uh, Jacobi theta function identities, the Mervius group, and all sorts of I'm not going to spend much time on that, but, but if you're interested, go and read about it. It's a very beautiful thing. So let's look at all the morphisms of this, of, of, this, of this situation. So we've got this representation on R2, and we want to look for, for a homomorphism of R2, which preserve the multiplier. Well, instead of using the, the original multiplier, the multiplier sigma, I'll use one that's really equivalent to it, and it's given by this, it's the skew symmetric form of the multiplier, like this. And then I look for automorphisms of R2 which preserve the, and when I go through the calculations, I get SL2. So if A is an ambiguous <laughs> function, so is A, of alpha of Tf for any alpha in So ambiguity functions, the space of ambiguity functions has this symmetry problem. So, uh, so I start with uh, the original representation of the Heisenberg group. I compose it with one of these members of SL2R and I'll get a, an equivalent representation. <coughs> so given any alpha 
form an equivalent representation by doing its composition. That means I must have a unitary operator that, that, that uh, intertwines this representation with this representation. Let's call it u alpha, and it satisfies it. So since d is irreducible, u alpha must be moving up to a scalar. And we can see that u alpha beta has the same effect uh, as u alpha times u beta. So at u alpha beta, is, effect, is, is effectively the same as, as this, except for the scale, because in order, that, in order that they have the same effect, they must be equal up to a, a, a constant. So U itself is a multiplier representation of SL2. And so I can take the double covering of SL2R, I can add in a center, if you like, and I can get an ordinary representation of this double covering and that's that's uh, this is called uh, this is called a metaplectic representation. One a particular subgroup of, of uh, SL2R is is the rotations, and it's easy to see that in the Wagner Siegel representation a rota uh, uh, representation. The, the, the lift, uh, the, the metaplectic of a rotation is just obtained by multiplying in the complex plane by e to the 2 pi i. So, so, uh, um, so the eigenvectors of, of, of this thing are just these monomials. And eigenvectors, eigenvectors of u r alpha must be, uh, uh, must be the Vn's, of course, because we know those matter the Vn's. And so these Vn's must have rotation. So this ur alpha is actually a fraction of Fourier transform. And you can write its formula down by just doing intertwining operators of representation. All right, so, so that's a survey of standard Heisenberg Weil of, of uh, ambiguity theory. And now I want to come on to something that, that really represents what we've been thinking about, although well, much, much of what I'm going to say up front is fairly standard anyway. So let's replace the real numbers by a finite group, a finite uh, cyclic group. It's then n. And we want to do the same theory there as we did for R. So you have to realize that in, in the heisenberg weyl theory, that we look at R2, remember, we've got time and frequency. And really, they're not the same R. One is the dual of the other. And so really, we should also be looking not only at Zn, but its dual as well. But it so happens, of course, uh, that, that the dual of Zn is also Zn. So we can play the same game as we did in, in, in the uh, in, in the real case, and think of, um, um, as I will do, and think of the, the dual that actually means in it. Um, in, in a more general abelian case, you can do this whole theory in a general setting, in a general abelian group, uh, you'll, you, you'll have uh, a, copy of, a copy of the group and a copy of the dual group, you take their product, and the, the, uh, and the, the, uh, the, uh, um, the ambiguity function for this situation will sit on this product. So we'll uh, so we'll think of uh, our, our waveforms now in this finite situation that's belonging to the Hilbert space H, which is just L2 of Zn, which of course is absolute Cn. And we'll define our representation to look like this. Uh, it's translation, but now translation module n times omega to the u times t, where where omega is a primitive. And really, this, this gadget here just, it just encapsulates the duality between the, the two copies of Zn. So rather than think about the group, let's just think about the operators, the, the image of this representation, right? And they look like this. So this is the unitary multiplier representation of Zn cross Zn, and the multiplier looks like this. So it's exactly the same, except we've changed 
Um, so we take a linear operator on this O2 space, and we can write it as a linear, com because delta is irreducible, we can write it as a linear combination of these coefficients. And so, and how do we get the S's out of, out of how do we get these little S's out of knowing capital S? We do the uh, the Val transform, which take the trace of this operator. standard orthonormal basis, where an orthonormal basis now is these numbers. So in particular, we can take, for our member of, for our linear operator on L2 of Zn, a one-dimensional projection. Take a member of L2 of Zn, uh, call it phi, and take the, the operator, which is in a part of the phi with the psi times. And then we can write down how this looks using the valve uh, transform, and which is decomposed in terms of the deltas, and the coefficients in this case turn out to be, not surprisingly, the ambiguity function, or at least its complex conjugate, of the of the uh, of, of the uh, uh, vector. Okay, so now I want to start talking about Rolex. Set things up enough that I can talk. So Golay sequences. These, these beautiful slides, by the way, are due to Stephen, who's falling asleep uh, over there. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a marvelous uh, subside. So Golay sequences uh, have been around for about, uh, well, there's some debate about this. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the engineers would say the Golay sequences have been around since early 1951. And the mathematicians would say that the Shapiro sequences have been around since a couple of months later. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, Golay invented them in, in the context of, of uh, X-ray spectroscopy. And uh, Hal Shibiro invented them uh, in the context of harmonic analysis, almost simultaneously, within months of each other. Uh, and um, they are unimodular sequences, say of length capital N. Um, and they have this property that their order correlation functions are just delta functions. When you add the order correlation, so you get it. So let me show you what. So if I, if I, this, this is my, this is my Golay sequence. This is another copy of the same Golay sequence. This is so the Golay sequence has come in pairs. So this is the other member of the pair. And this is a <coughs> copy of this thing. And I'm going to correlate. So I'm going to slide this along, take inner products uh, 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 of the of the result of, of, of the overlap, and look at the numbers that come up as I do that. So this is these are the list of inner products as I slide along. These will be filled out as I move along, and these are the list of inner products over here as I slide in. And I'm going to add them. About, about the ambiguity function. Golay sequences ought to be the answer to a radar engineer's prayer. Right? They, you, if you transmit these two sequences, do the match filter, do this, 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 this filtering as it comes by, and add them together, you'll get no side lobes at all. At least, no side lobes in range. There are actually side lobes and very significant well no let me go back so the problem the first problem is how do i transmit two sequences so there are many ways people have thought about this and, and, and we have two one of them is 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 the standard way to think about it is to translate them in, uh, send them uh, separated in time i send sequence a then sequence b and then sequence a again and then sequence b again and i keep going um, if you do that, you get this beautiful range property that the range is a perfect spike, but the Doppler is lousy. 
absolutely awful. And so, and you read all the standard radar books and they say, all this will be a great idea except for this. Um, and uh, another way you might think about separating them, and people have done this in the literature, is to separate them in frequency. Well, it turns out for rather subtle reasons that this can't be done. I mean, well, you can do it, but you don't get the answer you want. Because the, 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 uh, uh, the, there's a phase factor in, in, the, in the ambiguity, if you look carefully at it, which is dependent on the, the distance away of the target. And, it, and it's measured, that distance is measured in wavelengths. So if I separate these two goal layers in frequency, I'm changing my way of measuring the distance to the target. So effectively, I'm separating the target to two different targets, which are at different distances in terms of wavelengths. And so when I start doing the adding up things, maybe. So one of the things we've done, which I'm not going to talk about today, is actually find ways, instead of, instead of sending the goal lasers A, B, A, B, A, B, which is pretty boring, we've actually found ways of, of reordering the way we send them to reduce the, uh, to reduce the amount of dots. And, and interestingly enough, the way you code how you send them <coughs> is based on a famous mathematical sequence called the Prueto y Mos sequence, which is ideally suited to reduce Doppler side loads using these dots. Okay, so so here's some pictures of Golay pairs. You might you might say that, that you know Golay sequences are, are, are you might you might say Golay sequences pretty weird things to transmit. They're ones and minus ones. Uh, we represent these in terms of a waveform as phases, which is the phase. But, 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 but you might say, well, how can you rapidly change the phase from plus one to minus one? Well, it doesn't really matter that much. Even if I make the phase change slowly, I will still, when I add things together, get a very nice waveform with no side lobes. It's not a perfect spike, but it's pretty close. So, in fact, that's not a real problem. You can actually transmit something that is a very good approximation to Gole sequences, and which behaves perfectly well as far as it's ambiguous. So, I want to re-express the Gole property, Gole property for a sequence of length n, back in this Heisenberg type view of the world. That is back in terms of the Heisenberg group on ZN. And it turns out to be this. Well, if I translate Phi psi of Gole complementary means that if I translate in time uh, phi and in a product, that's just the cor order correlation, and do the same psi, and I add them up, I should get zero except one time tell you. So another way to write this is, is to say that the trace of this, this projection that corresponds to phi plus this projection that corresponds to psi. Uh, times delta times this translation operator is zero. <coughs> so now I want finally to look at another um, another Eisenberg value. I hope this story will all come together. <laughs> well, maybe we'll see. Um, so, um, so I want to replace Zn, this cyclic group, mm -hmm. by this highly non-cyclic group, namely finite product of copies of Z2. Um, where, and when I'm going to make my capital N equals 2 to the N. So these are the same size sets, but they're not the same groups, of course. In here, we're adding, adding uh, uh, integers modulo N, and here we're adding a vector of, 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 of integers modulo 2. So, but you can still do Heisenberg, you can still do the Heisenberg Bile theory here, you can Look at the space of operators like I did for Zn, and it looks like this. You might worry about why there's an I there. And the problem is that there's, there's these usual issues in, in, when you look at things over Z2. Things go slightly wrong compared to compared to the, 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 the Zn case. And so putting the I in just helps solve this. So don't worry about it. It's effectively the same thing. Um, <coughs> So this is the, 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 the group of operators we're looking at. This is the irreducible representation of this group. 
that feels in the same way as for R of the Z. The group multiplication now looks like this, where we use this plus like this to mean addition, addition of these two vectors modulo. And we get commutation relations, exactly as before. And DAB and DAB dash commute the, the inner product of these two sets. <coughs> so, so what we'd like to do is somehow look at the, the algebra of the Heisenberg group of Zn and compare it to the algebra of the Heisenberg group of Z2 to the n. After all, they're the same size sets, so we can think of their own two spaces as being homomorphic. And what we like, what, but what we, but of course they're not the same groups. In, in, in the Zn case, we're adding integers. We, if you like, if you like, you can think of elements of both of these groups as, as being represented in binary. And in the Zn case, we're adding with carry, and carry things. And in the Z2 to the n case, we're adding without carry. And so what, what we'd like to do is, 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 make, is find a way of relating the two representations, the two sets of operators, which of course we can do. We can represent, we can always write delta t zero, tau zero as a linear combination of DABs and vice versa. So this is the formula. This is how you write a translation in, in, in Zn in terms of these uh, uh, Heisenberg Y operators in D A uh, in Z2 to D A. And I need one piece of notation. C A is the set of binary vectors covered by A. What do I mean by covered by A? I mean the elements of C A have to be zero where A is zero. So you get this really strange looking formula which tells you how to relate translation. By the way, once you've got translation, you can do frequencies. So you, you can relate translation <coughs> uh, in, in the ZN case to these, these uh, operators in, in, in the ZN case. And the supports for the delta tau zeros are, are so that supports by supports, I mean, where the, where the, the ABs for which this term is non-zero look like this. Yeah, yeah. So two to the n by two to the n. And here and these you get these strange looking fractal sets. And then I go up to the next dimension. all this useful for. This is, by the way, this is theorem by the Chums. That's called by Howard and Moran. Um, and, uh, and it says this. Suppose I have a goal A, suppose I have a, a goal A pair, phi and psi, but they stay goal A whenever I apply, apply <coughs> DAB to phi and DAB to psi. So this is a goal A pair, which is, is an orbit of goal A pairs. That is, uh, whenever I move around by the, by the uh, uh, group representation, I stay rolling. What I'd like to be able to do is, is, is find a, 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 a characterization of this, of objects like that, uh, in terms of this uh, bio Heisenberg structure of the two here. Remember, goal A, goal A is about Zn, it's about translation in Zn. How can I express it in terms of Z2 to the end? Well, the answer is here. The, the, this pair is a, uh, this pair phi psi is a goal A orbit in the sense, if and only if the support of the ambiguity of phi and the amb plus the ambiguity of psi does not intersect one of these diagonal sets. So that's a necessary and sufficient condition for a goal A. All right, well, that's my last slide. That's as far as I'm going. Thank you very much. We have a calculator. Oh. <laughs>
too hard to calculate. No, no. I had a student many years ago who calculated what some power slow down is, and she just sent it to me. Well, <laughs> yes. Mackey called his multiplier representations projective. Yeah, I actually had some slides on projective, but I, I took them out and decided it was too esoteric. Yeah, I was wondering how you chose your terminology. Yeah. I, are you also, uh, the purpose of forethought, the avoiding talking about group cohomology, two cohomology. I had some slides on that too, and I took those out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of deconstructing your... your yeah, that's right. right. I decided it was just becoming too pure mathematical. But yeah. I sort of hang, hang on to my former life as a pure mathematician by my fingernails these days. Also, it's just far too extensive. Uh, it's much too much. Yeah. So, for example, when you were doing the annihilation and creation, you just did the boson. That's right. Okay, yes. you yeah. stay away from the Fermi. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful.